and welcome to this evening's senior college class. This is actually our last class of the spring semester. Although we're currently working on the fall classes, which are gonna be somewhat different, I think, than we had this semester. This semester we had a lot of Zoom classes. Now with things loosening up with COVID and places opening up, um, there's a real possibility we're going to have uh, some some live classes. I mean, in-person classes and even field trips. And so uh, stay tuned. The schedule will be coming out uh, in a month or so and uh, maybe two months, but it'll be there. And uh, But tonight we have a real kind of a special class. You know, in previous, previous weeks, we referred to it as mental health because you go to the library to to repair your brain, but um, but it's a the library is such a, a big important institution in the community, and tonight we're going to find out how it the Fort Kent Public Library came about and uh, what it's doing today and uh, and looking at the future as well. And we have tonight the the instructor is Steph Gagne. Now Steph Gagne. Has, was on the board of directors for the library for more than 30 years. So if anybody knows anything about the Fort Kent Public Library, he does. And so, Seth, thank you for doing this class, and the class is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Don. Um, so I guess I'm going to try and get this first slide up. And So here we go. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being so kind as to show up tonight. This should be interesting. Um, it's uh, my presentation and my version of the history of the Fort Kent Public Library. Uh, I don't know if there are any outstanding versions of this, but we had to start somewhere. So please bear with me as I muddle through the 60 plus slides that I hope are in some somewhat of a chronological order. Uh, I'll attempt to keep this about, uh, you know, between an hour, an hour and a half long, and please feel free to remind me every five slides or so, uh, if you want me to, you know, so I can stop and address any questions or any comments that you might have. Um, I certainly want to acknowledge Don for facilitating this presentation and for mentoring me through the Zoom, through the art of the Zoom process. <laughs> This was quite interesting. So here we go. Uh, we're doing this in three parts. The past, the present, the future. The past was, uh, as it reads, a humble and very historical uh, past. Um, you know, as much as I would like the Fort Kent Lions Club to take credit for starting the Fort Kent Public Library, I can't do that. As a matter of fact, the club, which was started in 1940, uh, didn't exist when the talk began of a public library. And it was started by the Fort Kent DPW. Um, so this was back in 1936. The women's club decided to work towards funding a library project there, were, there was a, a dance that was held initially, and the monies were deposited into a new Fort Kent Public Library Fund. And that eventually made it possible for the library to be built. Uh, 1939, the, the club had uh, appointed a select committee to look into putting together a library. Uh, it was actually a library committee. Names like David Garso, Romeo Thibodeau from the Rotary, Albert Sear from the Lions Club, Francis Malcolm, who was a superintendent of schools back then, and from the BPW, names like Catherine Morneau, Dora Pinkham, Francis McCaskill, Hilda Crocker, Francis Willette. So this goes back quite a ways. Um, and they really are the, are the founding members of the Fort Kent Public Library. Um, 
I'm going to move down to the next slide uh, because this is not quite sure where this one came from, but it was interesting anyway. So it reads during the winter of 2930, the members of the school board uh, included uh, Richard Crocker, uh, Mr. Phil Thibodeau, and Laurie Fournier uh, were interested in the library movement and voted to have the school department pay transportation for traveling libraries from the state extension bureau to come in and temporarily set up a library in Fort Kent. So even before 1936, there were things that were going on. And you see in the photo there, uh, the, the, the block the, uh, that housed back then Thibodeau's insurance, I think Maine Public might have been in there for a period of time. But now it houses, of course, Walker's Pub and um, uh, U.S. Cellular. Again, 2930, there's, a, there's mention of Thibodeau Hall. I'm not sure about Thibodeau Hall, but I know it's Sear Hall and Nowlin Hall on campus. But one, there was a room there that was dedicated to some books that were being provided by the state library. So here we're back in, in 1939, and you see a photo there of Dora Pinkham, who was the founding uh, member. She was actually the treasurer of the club. Catherine Morna was the chair chair uh, person, and you see again the names of the original committee that was formed uh, to try and put this this deal together to fund the library. Library Bill of Rights. I found that quite interesting because this was adopted by the group in 1939, and you know it has some interesting information like. Uh, you know, they talk about books and other resources that should be provided for the, for the community. Uh, but here's a couple of interesting pieces. Number two says, libraries should provide materials and information presenting all points of view on current and historical issues. Materials should not be proscribed or removed because of partisan or doctrinal, or doctrinal disapproval. Even today, we go through some of that. You know, which books belong on the shelves and which books don't belong on the shelves. So that, that's a kind of an interesting thing that even back then there was talk about that. Uh, a person's right to use the library should not be denied or abridged because of, obviously, origin, age, background, or views. Uh, libraries which make exhibit spaces and meeting rooms available to the public they serve should make such facilities available on equitable basis regardless of the beliefs or affiliations of the individuals or groups requesting their use. And that's really nothing new, but again, this was stuff back in 1939 that we discovered in, our, in the archives. Uh, so here in 1936, there's a couple of, of uh, articles in the newspaper and they're talking about this dance that I talked about a while ago, which was a fundraiser to, to, to set up the initial fund uh, for the building of the library. Uh, I'm not going to go down and read through this, but there were several groups that got together. There was some people from the State of Maine uh, Library uh, Association that came up and spoke to the BPW and other groups in Fort Kent. Um, so between the benefits that different kinds of benefits that were established, the raise funds and these groups coming in, there was always talk about the library. Uh, this one says the uh, state librarian comes to speak before Fort Kent clubs, town groups to meet discussion formation of the li of a library association, and it's just more of the same people that uh, I mentioned a little while ago. And that's what I was just reading off of. But we've kept those clips, and uh, we have uh, an archive at the library. And these were provided to me by Michelle Raymond, the librarian. Uh, matter of fact, she had quite a display that she put on when we opened the facility for a period of time during the 150th, no, the 200th, no, 150th anniversary in Fort Kent, and then the 200th for the state, but we had uh, put together a little presentation and that was included. In that. 
So here we go. The first library was a room in the town office and was open Tuesday and Thursday evenings and Saturday afternoons uh, with a worker in charge. And the, uh, that's a picture of the old town office. And I think that, that was located pretty much in front of what was Dr. Ben Willett's house and Bob Misha owned for a period of time and Paul Burby right on that corner uh, is where the old town office used to be. Down on the bottom there, you see that Article 18 in 1940 was to see if the town would vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $200 uh, for the library. Mm. So all of, all of $200. Of course, back then, that was a lot of money. Yeah. So 1941, it gets moved into what was called the Morno Building. Now, that's where up north outdoors is currently located. That was the Morno Block, and she was one of the founders of the library committee. Um, So uh, during that time, they, they had a campaign for subscribers that netted them $299.15. That's a, apparently a historical fact. So they were able to raise actually a little bit more money than was appropriated by the town. Uh, that has some, a little bit of significance to it because over the course of time, that almost continues to be the case. Nineteen forty-two. I'm not quite sure why that slide moved, but maybe I did something here. Um, those of you who recognize the fire hall, the library moved into what was then the firehouse, and over to the right you see a couple of doors. So the library was in there. Uh, that eventually, and it housed uh, fifteen hundred books or so. That eventually became the home of David Babin, who. Huh? The care of the fire of the firehouse, and then off to the left of the building was the police station. The original, I said the original police station, the one that I knew <laughs> before they before they moved where the town office is today. But uh, uh, the firehouse housed fifteen hundred books, so you know, a pretty decent, a pretty decent start even back in nineteen forty two. So things start to move. Uh, in 44, the library was incorporated. And, you know, we, we dug up some of this information uh, pretty much for, for several reasons. We wanted to know about the, the ending of the library as far as its corporate standing, as far as its tax standing, uh, that was information that we needed for several reasons. And so we've managed to dig that information up. But um, this is stuff that you can now see, I, I believe it like the Registry of Deeds, uh, which... Uh, Steph? Yes. I see Terry on there. What's the first name? I can't make it out. Dana L. Terrio. Huh. Now he... Um, I'm not quite sure what his position was, but my, my suspicion is that he was probably working somebody who was a registrar at the Registry of Deeds. And that's where this was filed, okay. corporation, or this incorporate, incorporation paperwork. Um, it says Fort Kent in the county of, uh, public library in the town of Fort Kent in the county of Aristic uh, State of Maine. Uh, but it doesn't say exactly where this is filed. But I'm assuming it was at the Registry of Deeds. There's a little bit of history as to the, the site that the library is located on as well. So I'm kind of backtracking here a little bit. But that area originally was called Monument Square. Mm -hmm. uh, Military Square, Monument Square. I, I, I suspect it was probably Military Square first. 
Uh, and that was in conjunction with the building of the library, and there were grounds where, the, where troops would, would march and would, you know, get together. Um, so Military Square has some significance, but back then there was a, there was a, a general store. In 1905, there was a general store, a warehouse owned by H.W. Sawyer. Uh, there was uh, an organization called Swift and Company, had some a company office there. And then eventually uh, those buildings came down and the, uh, the Page brothers were involved in the ownership of that property. And I, I'm gonna try and get to, the, to, to their names and I, it was known as the Page Lot between Pleasant Street and Main Street which the monument to World War I veterans stands. So that monument is still there, obviously, today. Um, let me see what else. Is. It's, it's kind of difficult to read, but uh, again, Dora Pinkham was involved there and the, and the rest of the DPW members. So in 57, Fort Kent had a, a special town meeting and there was a warrant for the construction of a library. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it there because the slide is, is, is pretty um, light. But uh, the purpose of this meeting is to see if the voters of the town will authorize the councillors to borrow 20000 for the construction wow. of the library. The original request was 10000 and I think when the design came in and the might have had something to do with construction costs at the time. They went back to the voters and they actually doubled the amount that they were looking for. Uh, and that that was appropriated, uh, but the original the original request was ten thousand mm. dollars. So that was in fifty seven. So here we are three years later. My suspicion that. My suspicion is that they probably went back to the voters because of the time frame that was involved in finally getting this all together. Uh, so in 1960, library became a reality with the construction beginning in April. Dedication ceremonies were held on July 31st. And the library committee at that time, uh, Philip Thibodeau was chairman, Pearl Berry was secretary, Jim Hoyt, Mary Picard, Harry Eskivitz, Catherine Morneau and Dave Daigle were the members. And uh, you see down there on the bottom uh, left, Article 10, uh, the Budget Committee voted at that time $500 to uh, raise an appropriate for the, for the function of the library. Uh, Senator Margaret J. Smith was at the ribbon cutting, which is kind of interesting. And those of you who remember Alice Morey, uh, she was the librarian, and she was there from 1959 until April of 1977. So, kind of long tenure. 18 years. For Alice Morey. And I remember Mrs. Morey and Doc Morey, who was a taught at the university, and we were first married. We lived in Freeman's Trailer Park, and they were neighbors. <laughs> what was her so, name again? Uh, her Alice. name was Alice. And the, and the last name? Mori, M-O-R-E-Y. And I think there was a standing joke in the community with Doc Mori, because I think he wore the same blazer for the 30 or 40 years that he taught university. I, I see some people snickering there. But <laughs> oh, true. I believe that's a fact. Uh, but they were, they were nice neighbors, and uh, she was a very conscientious uh, librarian. And during you know her tenure, the first phase, of the library was built. And that's the section that you enter, still enter into today uh, with a basement uh, down on the, on the uh, Main Street side. Uh, but that was it, it was just that small piece right in the middle. So moving to 1965, uh, obviously we'd run out of space and that was, uh, 
you know, pretty quick. In five years, we'd run out of space. And, and understandably so, if there were 1,500 books housed at the firehouse, brought into that small section that was built, and then adding more circulation, uh, they outgrew it very quickly. And so there was uh, a fundraising to add what I what is now the adult wing of the library, or the or the uh, the easterly wing of the library. Um, I circled a, a section here. It says uh, they talk about Bill Page and his brother David Page of the GM Page Estate made a gift at that time to the library of the roadway separating the monument lot, and the library lot. So they had kept the piece where the monument was located, but they donated that piece because the wing was going to abut it, and I suspect it was going to be right on the line or very close to the line. So to resolve any issues, maybe they, they just donated that piece of property. Uh, and I, I, I added another note that said, uh, you know, there's an old adage, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Well, uh, the Page brothers gave some property, and, and uh, over the course of time, the state took a lot of it back. Oh. Uh, every time they widen Pleasant Street, they take a piece. Every time they do a little work on Main Street, uh, the sidewalks start to encroach. And so the parking lot has gotten smaller and smaller all the time. Um, just the nature of of, uh, you know, the, the community that we're in and, and the amount of traffic that's, you know, increased over a period of time and those kinds of things. But uh, we've, we've given away a substantial amount of property. And I say given away, they just take it. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's but you see there uh, the, the, the two parts of the library original pieces. So this is just a little bit of it. Whoops! I'll do that. So the library expanding facilities, and this is when uh, at a time where Marlene Pooler took over the library, 1977, and uh, they were looking for for funding. There were some grant monies that were applied uh, for um, the. Um, Library itself put on some fundraisers. You're going to see that in the next slide. But uh, Marlene was uh, very instrumental in uh, the expansion of the library that first that first time around. And you'll see she was instrumental the second time around as well. But there you see there was a bottle drive that was held, and you see uh, a photo of some kids who were involved in the bottle drive. Uh, Marlene had written a letter to the editor, and that was published in the St. John Valley, uh, just expressing her gratitude. But in the photo there, uh, I'm going to read uh, the name, because I don't know if you can see them or not. But uh, from left to right, you see Marlene on the, on the left, librarian. In the front row, uh, Carrie Levac, Nikki Roy, Chuck Dow, Amy Raymond, Neely Joller, Tony Wilbur, and then you see Ann Joller there on the right. And in the back row, Jamie Daigle, Wendy Burby, Chantelle Legree, Aaron Carlson, now Aaron Susie, Stacey Bouchard, and I think Char Charlton Wilbur. <laughs> You probably remember uh, a lot of those names, but those are the kids that were involved in the bottle drive. This next slide has some interesting faces as well. And this was a telethon that was conducted. And uh, of course, you see in the top, uh, off to the left, uh, Laurel Daigle, next to him, Rod Bedore, Henry Carboni, Ron Haley, Priscilla Daigle. And Teresa Pinkham, all on the phone, uh, doing a phone-a-thon and, and 
raising funds. Um, it doesn't. It says that they were they were trying to raise thirty two thousand dollars as part of the cost share that was involved, and I believe the amount that they had applied for on the grant side uh, was forty seven thousand five hundred and sixty dollars. So now you're talking about a, you know, close to but well, you're talking about an eighty thousand dollar building or addition. You know, so from the twenty thousand dollars originally, now eighty thousand dollars, just a few years later, but a substantial um, addition to the library, a physical addition to the library. Down below, uh, you see the ribbon cutting. Um, there's uh, Keith Lambert, who was the county commissioner back then. Next to him, uh, Jean-Paul Duval was the councillor. Janet Michaud. Uh, was a director. Tom Scott was a director. Harry Eskovitz was also a director. And then you see Claude Duma there in the back uh, was the town manager. Ron Haley is a director. Randy Pinkham, director. Mark Michaud on the town council. Marlene Pooler next to him. Uh, and Mike Sear, who was the main library commission chairman at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly enough, right in the middle, a little, little, a little lady with the white hair is Pearl Berry. She was uh, honored with the uh, ribbon cutting. She served, for the li she served the library 30 years. Oh, wow. Unreal. Of, of library directors. Steph? Yeah. Was Dora Pinkham Randy's mother? I don't know. Uh, there weren't that many Pinkham families in town, so yeah. got to be some relation there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I do want to say that, that you know, when, as I was looking at these names, this is about the time I came in uh, to the library. 19, I'm going to say around 1985, because Tom Scott was still on the committee, uh, Randy, Harry Eskovitz, uh, and Jan Michaud, uh, as well as Ron Haley were still... On the on the committee when I came when I came on board. There you go. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. It's uh, the new construction begins. This was in 1984, and we call it the Children's Wing. That's the west side, the end towards uh, Valley Auto. And uh, again, a sizable addition, about the same size as the one uh, that was uh, built for the adult uh, section. And uh, you, you also see that there was a handicap ramp that was built at that, probably around that time as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I don't know who designed it, but it, you know, it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty good looking building. It's a little bit unfortunate that it hasn't got more parking than it has for multiple reasons, both for the patrons who come into the library, uh, but also for the use of the, the, the uh, Main Street side of the library as well. There's very little, very little access, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but... Um, like I say, I, I think the parking lot probably lost uh, four, four to, between four and six spaces over a period of time. So we're moving along uh, and into uh, you know what what is now what I call the present uh, of the library, the uh, the present time frame of the library, um, and and that. There were a lot of changes and some great opportunities as well that presented themselves over this period of time, and, and we'll go through some of those. Uh, but it, it, um, I don't want to get bogged down in the minutia. But there's some there's some parts to this portion that are that you I, I hope you'll find quite interesting, and in what leads us to where we are right today. Hmm. So uh, in 2006. Uh, Marlene retired, and Michelle Raymond became the librarian. And, and here you have 
some photos of the library as it exists today uh, with a library sign uh, with the view from, from Main Street. Uh, and it says library entrance there with that little photo in the middle, but I, 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 I'm quite sure, yeah, that's the, that was taken from the inside because you can see the drop box there off, off to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, that library entrance needs a lot of help, and we'll talk about that as well uh, coming up. But, uh, you know, this is a good-sized building. There's, um, I want to say, uh, 1,200 square feet of available space on the two sections, that's the middle section and the section to the left on the bottom part of the library. The section to the right is only accessible uh, from that door that you see and from the upstairs of the library. The other two sections are not accessible directly from the library. You have to go outside. And that's what made it you know, leasable, income-producing space over an extended period of time. Uh, before I get right into this, to this slide, I, I, I want to get into one that's... Uh, well, actually, we can talk about this slide, because I just mentioned that the leasable space over... Over a substantial length of time, well, you know, probably about 57 years, maybe a little bit more, 60 years, mid-60s through 2017, there were multiple lessors. Uh, it started with FHA. I don't know if anybody remembers FHA there. I, did, I do, and maybe I dreamt it, but <laughs> I want to say that when we first bought the house I was brought up in on Elm Street, that my mother sent me there with an envelope. And it had to be on, you know, a, like a $12 monthly payment or something. Uh, and that seems to me that's where FHA was. And then it moved over to where Lee Terrio is now housed. And Barney Netto and John Daigle got together and built a new funeral home. Because that, that building that Lee is in now, that was Netto's funeral home. And FHA moved into that section. Uh, that's what I remember. And then, of course, after that, Dona Misho, Don Misho's dad, moved out of his house on Pleasant Street and moved downstairs and opened an office there. With, and I believe probably Don got in at around that time. Uh, and Jim Dupre and I, when we bought out Don's widow, Mary, we stayed there for... Oh, I want to say, originally it was, it was Nelson Bouchard and Jim Dupre for the first three or four years, and then Jim and I for 10 years at Michaud's Insurance. Uh, so, you know, that, that goes a little ways. Um, and then when Michaud's Insurance moved out and moved into the Thibodeau Agency, we sold the United Insurance Group, yeah. I was working with North State. Okay. And... We had an office in Ashland that we were building, and the old office had a bunch of equipment and, and uh, desks and countertops, and I put all of that in a moving truck and moved it all into Fort Kent, and we opened our first office, North State, downstairs at the library. And so that continued, um, you know, the, the funding that the library uses for operations because the bulk of our funding comes from donations for, uh, for books or fines or, or whatever, outright donations, and the lease of that space. That's what kept the library going operationally for years. In 2010, uh, you don't see this slide, but I'm going to read off of it a little bit. We had uh, about $100,000 in CDs, plus some some other monies that were available, and uh, and I don't want to slight anyone, and that's not my intention, but the the board had been relatively conservative, and they wanted the library to, 
continue into perpetuity uh, using what little monies were, were derived from interest income on these CDs. Well, you know, 5%, that's $5,000 a year. And that's okay, operationally speaking. But there was a lot of deferred maintenance. And we, we, we needed to do something. There was, there was a, we had asbestos siding. Mm. Uh, the windows were all old double-hung windows, needed, needed some work. And the doors needed to be replaced. Painting, uh, you know, uh, carpentry, all of this good stuff. So anyway, we, we came out with uh, a budget, uh, and we had at that time $83,000 or so available in CDs. Uh, we spent $62,486 of that money to renovate all facets of the library, windows all the way around, um, new siding, the abatement costs, um, and that was probably the last major uh, renovation that the library went through in 2010. And what year was that, Steph? Uh, 2010, uh, 2010. Mm. Uh, going back to those who, who uh, rented, the, uh, who leased the space, after North State, those of you who remember, uh, Paul Burby, uh, Peter Rubbishow, John, um, uh, Dr. John, I remember his last name now, uh, and Steve Daigle, John Narana, excuse me, and Steve Daigle opened a sign shop. And it was called PPJ Signs and more or, or whatever it was. But they, uh, they were in there for two or three years, if that. And I'm not, there was a period of time there where we, we were vacant. Uh, and then Toby Jandro came in and was there for four years, I want to say, before he moved on to Market Street. And then an organization called FedCap, which was... Uh, and still is in Fort Kent, and they deal with, uh, I want to say it's uh, teaching uh, people who have been laid off, giving them classes, or trying to find them work, those kinds of things. And I'm not exactly sure, but I know it's, it's, a, it's a non-profit organization that came in to the state of Maine and opened multiple offices and Fort Kent was one of those offices and I was involved in getting them into Fort, into Fort Kent as far as finding space for them and met with them a couple of times they came in and looked at the library they liked what they saw they were okay with the fact that there was only parking available on Main Street and those kinds of things uh, so we were happy to have them they signed a five year lease we gave them, there's some work that they had to do to make it worth their while coming in, uh, some uh, improvements, capital improvements that they wanted to make. They asked us for, uh, they wanted us to make those improvements and, and the board, met with the board, and we, we decided that we didn't want to do that. That if they wanted that space, then they should make the improvements to their liking. Uh, then they came back and asked us if we would consider uh, absolving them of the first few months of rent in lieu of the dollars that they were going to put in in capital improvement. We, we agreed to that. Um, so it, it, it didn't get off to a really good start uh, because there were some issues with electrical bills not being changed over to their name um, they, um, every time we were in touch with them, we were talking with somebody different. Eventually, uh, you know, I was able to get them to pay us the electrical bill that had been run up, uh, over $600. 
And then there was an $1,800 bill for the June, July, and August rental credit that had been given uh, in lieu of the work that they were going to do, capital improvements, which had not been done. And by that time, they have, were giving us their notice they were leaving. Wow. So we went, down, we went downstairs and took a look around. And I mean, it, it was not the, the, you know, in the greatest of shape. And I, you know, I, I, I want to apologize for bringing up that name. But this, this is, was a situation that should never have occurred. And, um, but it did. And it took a long time to collect those dollars. The reason that I bring this up is because it left a lasting <clears throat> impression on the board and on me in particular, uh, because now all of a sudden, uh, rental income was becoming a major hassle. It's not like it had been over the years where you had a tenant for, there for years on end, never an issue collecting uh, the rental dollars. Now we're spending months, and, and it's vacant, and we're, and we're spending months trying to collect past due rents and th those kinds of things. And I say past due. It was, you know, obviously there was a difference of opinion on how things should have been done. But uh, in the end, it worked itself out. We were paid in full, but it, but it left a real sour taste. And so... Uh, it brings up this slide here, which, which maybe some of you are familiar with, and, and, and maybe you're not. But the, the town of Fort Kent, for many, many, many years now, before my time, uh, and until now, has funded the payroll portion of the expense of running the library. And that's substantial enough. Uh, it typically runs around, you know, would run, when I first came on board, it was probably in, in the low 20s. It's now about thirty-three, about $33,000. And that includes, you know, the, the wages, uh, the, the benefits, the unemployment, the workers' comp, uh, taxes, those kinds of things. And included in there is the, the water fees. Uh, because they charge us for water, but they turn around and pay them. I want to mention at this time that most public libraries in Aroostook County are operationally funded as well. The Fort Kent Public Library has not been operationally funded by any uh, town uh, dollars. We've always raised those funds. We've raised those funds either through rental income, outright donations from benefactors, uh, fundraising events, book sales, you know, those kinds of things. So that gives you a little bit of context here. Uh, my suspicion is that we need somewhere between seven and $10,000 a year to operate the library at a minimum at a minimum. That's besides the 33000 that the town affords us, thank God, because I, we wouldn't have a library. Um, <coughs> no, it's better here. So this is just a sample. Uh, in December of 2019, I sent a letter to uh, the town office, town manager in this case, as I did for a number of years. Uh, and it reads, on behalf of the Public Library Board of Trustees, I'd like to submit our formal budget request for 2020 fiscal year in the amount of $37,000. Request is based on the 2019 appropriation of 32400 which is projected to be very close or a bit shy of actual expended. A projected 2020 payroll 
of $35,351 includes the addition the additional 2400 to cover mandated increases by the state of Maine, mandated minimum payroll increases, uh, plus a $514 for property service and a small buffer of $1,100. Uh, it, it reads, as in years past, our single biggest operating expense continues to be our payroll and the requested increase will allow us to satisfy the current state of Maine minimum wage requirements. <laughs> now, you're probably asking yourselves, are librarians paid minimum wage? Well, no, they're not paid minimum wage. They're paid above minimum wage back then. Uh, but with the increases that were coming across from the state, that was being bumped up quite rapidly. And we needed to bump up the assistant librarian to keep up. And if you're going to bump up one, well, obviously you, you need to, you know, to follow through and do the same for, for the librarian as well. So that's the reason that the payroll started to increase and it's where it's at today. Uh, no fault of ours, no fault of the town. It's just something you know, that, that was mandated and it forced you know, the town to reevaluate our appropriation, and they agreed to do that as well as they did for their own employees. Uh, but we are, again, funded by the town of Fort Kent when it comes to the payroll. Probably can't see all the numbers here. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down through this relatively quick, but the bottom line of this is our total operating income January through December of 2018 was $74,000. That included what came from the, from the town of Fort Kent and some monies that were in our capital building fund, monies that were raised. Um, the, the library does have a sizable budget, but here's the interesting piece. In this particular report, which goes to the state of Maine, under operating expenses, our books, audiovisual, and subscriptions totaled a whopping $1,365. The electricity was over $2,000. So, you know, you got to pay your bills and you got to find the money somewhere. And so when all is said and done, what suffers sometimes is um, our subscriptions, our, our, our circulation uh, holdings, books, periodicals, audiovisual, all of that good stuff. And that's kind of been the case for a period of time. Um, but that's, that's the way, that's the way it is. And, you know, our, our total expenses that year were $39,000. Uh, it left, it left us 31,000 in the bank. Uh, some of that money was accumulated over a long period of time. Memorial donations, uh, are the, one of the main areas of, of income, uh, donations. And thank God for that. People have been very, very good, and, and we need to give them as much credit as we can. Coming back to the fact that we had lost our rental income down below, and that had become a hassle. In the winter of 2018, the trustees uh, took some time to look at alternative uses for the rental space on the Main Street level. One of the ongoing expenses was property taxes, which were assessed by the town. Now, you wonder why the town is ass assessing us taxes. Well, they weren't on the top part, the library portion, but the bottom portion, a rentable 1,200 square feet of space, became taxable. And that happened years ago. And it started out, I think there was a, some legislation about taxing nonprofits who were getting money from, from leasing 
uh, profitable space. A hospital with the doctors, offices, that was a big to do back then. Uh, the, the church parsonage, and they wanted to tax the parsonage, not the, not the church building, but the parsonage, uh, those kinds of things. And the library kind of fell into that same category. And so we had, we've been paying taxes for that space that was uh, rentable. Uh, we've been vacant at that point for over 18 months. Typically, we would get somewhere between $500 dollars and six, $700 a month for that space. That's relatively cheap, the 1,200 square feet of space on Main Street. But there's a lot of vacancy on Main Street, Fort Kent. And so we were, we were all going after the same tenants, so to speak. Uh, after much discussion, it was agreed that not only the rental space, but other library renovations were needed. Um, if we were going to use that space down below. One of the things that was prohibiting us from leasing that space and or using it for any other purpose, really, was the fact that the, the bathroom space down there was original, was the, in the original portion of the building, was the original bathroom. It couldn't have been more than Oh my goodness, nine feet square. Uh, and it was basically a, uh, a toilet and a sink. Mm -hmm. Nowhere near meeting any ADA standards. And so we knew that we would have to do something down there with that before we could do anything at all. Uh, we also knew that the roofing on the library was now 20 years old and would need replacing. Uh, some original wiring was still in the building. Uh, the, the lighting in the library was, was old fluorescent lighting. Um, that needed to be replaced, and we needed to take advantage of efficiency main rebates. We were hoping that that would uh, happen. And we were looking for the potential for some other, for the use of that space down below as a potential, you know, uh, art gallery or public meeting space, book club space. Those were some of the things that were discussed. Uh, we knew the library entrance on the top part uh, needed some rehab. Uh, and then, of course, the parking area needed to be resurfaced. So there was no question in our minds that uh, uh, there were more, uh, that was more than a frost heave there in the front of that, uh, of the library. There's, there was something else going on underneath that we, we think was probably an old water line or sewer line that uh, had been left there and was now starting to. Uh, Push the, push the ground up. Our initial estimates for all of this uh, was going to be somewhere between forty-five and 60000 And uh, we decided also that a capital campaign and grant funding uh, were probably things that we should look at. The first thing I did is I went to see um, Don Demo at the time. Um, and I, I was hoping that we could get a tax abatement on that property downstairs, uh, on that part of the building downstairs. First of all, because we hadn't received any rental income in over 18 months. And he agreed, but he said there's a process and you got to go through the process. And, and so we went to the, to the council uh, and eventually, uh, that was agreed upon, um, and uh, based on valuation in, in 2018, and we have not been received a tax bill since, but we had been receiving a tax bill of $1,000 a year. So you can see there was a couple of years there where we paid the taxes, but we had no, it wasn't, it wasn't deriving uh, any, any income at all. All the more reason for us to find some other use for that space, if not rental use. So now we're, we're uh, looking at kicking off a fundraising campaign, and that started in February of 
So we kicked it off, and there you see a photo, and you see, you see some familiar faces there, and I, um, gonna, I'm probably going to miss some, but in the background on the, on the left, you see Karen Quigley Willette, you see Michelle, the librarian, uh, you see uh, uh, let's see. Roger Stosier, I believe, mm -hmm. right behind me, Paul Willette, and then Judy to the, to the right of Paul. And then in the front, right in front of Judy, uh, you see Liz, Darnell Oliver with Jeans Electronics, and myself. Uh, so Liz, you're, I'm, I'm going to put you to the test here. Is it, what, what class was it, 64? 1968. Hey, I'm sorry. The class of 1968. The class of 1968 uh, had some monies left over from their reunion and were gracious enough to donate some of the first funds, if not the first funds, the first that, funds. that kicked off the campaign. And so what you see us holding there are plaques that were not engraved at the time, but there are, there are, they're all engraved now that name all of the people over the course of time that donated towards this goal of raising $20,000 locally. This was not grant funding. This was local dollars that we were trying to raise. I sent out about uh, uh, 30 uh, letters uh, requesting donations. And that's a copy of the letter there. Um, and it, I'm not going to read it all, but it talks about us trying to raise as much as $60,000, some of which we were hoping to get through grant dollars. But the bulk of this request was $20,000. Um, and in the bottom paragraph says, as with many capital campaigns, we are looking for any size contribution. All donations made within categories of 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 3,000, 3,000 to 5,000, as well as any over that, will be acknowledged on plaques in the library entrance area. Checks should be made payable to the Fort Kent Public Library. And the trustees thank you in advance for your consideration. So this letter, this is the letter, the initial letter that went out. And of course, we weren't uh, just sitting on our laurels either. Uh, the, the board of trustees was always looking at at the different ways of raising funds. Uh, a used book room was one of the things that we decided we wanted to do on the on the bottom side of the library. Uh, so. We shuffled books around, uh, used books, and uh, opened a space. And we did it around different events that were going on in, in the town at the time, like the Musky Derby Toy Festival. And we would open that room and people would come through. We'd offer, uh, you know, uh, coffee, water, uh, whatever, and a few baked goods that uh, some of the trustees uh, put together. And that was one of the ways that we were looking at, at raising uh, some money. You also, and that's basically what it looked like on the inside. Those are some, those are some older shelves that we had received, I believe, from the bottom of the parish. I believe these, these were bookshelves that were downstairs at the St. Louis Church. And they were looking to move them, and somebody called and said, could you use those? And we had them brought into the library downstairs, and we, we were, we were and continuing to use them for uh, bookshelves. You might also remember that we, we uh, Jake Terrio and a group got together and put together an escape room. Uh, and this uh, project, all said and done, raised almost $4,000. It, it took a while for it to kick off. And this was very popular, and it still is in some areas. But at the time, it was something that was very, very popular, although not necessarily in Fort Kent. A lot of people didn't know what escape rooms were. But those who went through it had a really, really good time. And they did a wonderful job putting it, to, putting it together. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that more people didn't go through it. But those of us that did had an absolute blast. Um, but like I say, that raised about, about $4,000. And correct me, Liz, if I'm wrong, but I believe that I'm pretty close uh, on that number. Yeah. Uh, then I also found out that uh, S.W. Collins uh, 
was offering uh, community grants at each of their locations. And so uh, I picked up some paperwork from them, put together an application, forwarded to them. Uh, we were lucky enough to receive uh, $300. What they were doing is they were offering four $300 grants in each community. And we were lucky enough in that first round or the second round to receive a grant uh, from SW Collins. There you see some of the results of the capital campaign. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to go down through all, all of these. I mean, people were very, very generous, as is always the case in Fort Kent. And it ranged, you know, from... I'm going to start with, you know, uh, $1,000 or so down to people who gave what they could. If it was $5, it was $5. But in the end, on this one sheet, there's $18,542 worth of donations. <laughs> so it was $20,000. Okay. Uh, what you don't see on this sheet is, and this is a little bit of a breakdown, but I, but I, I, I want, and I, there's some names here that are probably going to, uh, you know, people, people might feel that it shouldn't be public, but I just want to, I want to prove a point. During the Lions Club uh, Lions show, we put a, put a raffle together, 50-50 raffle. All proceeds were going to go to the library fund. So people were buying tickets right and left, and it, it was pretty amazing. But over three nights, uh, we raised a substantial amount of money. The lion's half went directly to the library. Out of the 50-50, there's uh, $1,000 that came back to us from winners that just said, thank you very much. We'd like to donate these funds to the library. You know, uh, what, what more can I say? But this is, this is the kind of contributions that we've been getting all along and the kind of support that we've had. And it, it, it's just a great, great thing. And it continues the, uh, the heritage of uh, giving and, and donations in Fort Kent. Nice. There are also some in-kind donations that I want to talk about because the original banner that was put up uh, was donated by Steve Daigle. Albert's jewelry, although they, you know, they, they had the charges for the plaques themselves, but all the little engraving that was done for each of the donations, they, they donated that time and, and talent and use of their equipment. Here's an interesting one, uh, 4D carpentry, and you'll see this come up again a little bit later. Uh, Travis Delisle and his boys gave us all of the labor to re-roof the library, as well as the volunteers from the Fort Kent Masonic Lodge. Uh, that was a Larry Murphy thing. Boy, those guys hit the ground running, did a great, great job, and they supplied all of the roofing labor along, you know, with the uh, guidance that was being provided by Travis. Other donations. It took a while, uh, but the Fort Kent Lions Club had kind of been sitting in the wings waiting to see how this was all going to come together, but had pretty much committed to giving us some dollars other than what was contributed through the Lions show. My argument with them was that they, they had raised those funds, but it wasn't their money. It was people walking through the door that were donating the money. I said, what about the Lions Club itself? You know? So they laughed about that and said, oh yeah, we'll do something eventually. Well, we, we, we eventually applied for grants, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but one of the things that grants do not do, do not provide funding for, is parking lot resurfacing. Can't, you can't include that in a grant. Matter of fact, I was told by Susie Parity, who's written that in a ton of grants, that if you if you include that in the grant, they probably will just set it aside. So we did not include that in our grant application. But I convinced the Lions Club that uh, and I've already received a couple of, of uh, estimates that five thousand dollars would do the trick, and uh, they eventually donated those dollars for that purpose. Uh, along the way, uh, the town of Fort Kent 
decided that they probably, through the appropriation process for uh, uh, and, and the budgeting process, they allocate X amount of dollars to street maintenance buy their uh, hot top at a discounted price. They agreed that they would do the parking lot. Went back to the Lions Club. They've agreed to throw those dollars towards the renovation of the vestibule, the entrance of the okay. That's a major you know, thing for us because uh, that just tacks on more dollars um, towards the renovation of the library. So there you see we raised uh, the capital fundraising uh, was met. Um, I wish I could give you a time frame. I don't have one. But I want to say it, it was uh, in the vicinity of five or six months that we raised those dollars. Uh, it was pretty much done by the time um, the fall rolled around because we were in hopes of having some work done in that that fall that we weren't able to do until the following spring, but, but that's the way it worked out. Uh, interesting tidbits. Uh, of course, I sent a, um, a thank you letter to the um, to the editor, and that was published um, through the St. John Valley Times and Fiddlehead Focus. Uh, donations ranged from five dollars to a thousand dollars. There was mention of the Masonic Lodge and the Grand Masonic Lodge combined to donate fifteen hundred dollars, uh, and we talked about the roof was quick, quickly deteriorating, and we wanted to make sure we didn't have a leak somewhere. And then you know we had some we had some major issues inside the library, but at that time we were talking about additional repairs to include electrical wiring, lighting fixtures, library entrance repairs, and weatherization, main level restroom remodel, book inventory upgrade. So uh, those were the things that we were talking about at the time and were included in that letter. Just a point of reference. Uh, in June 1998, Fred Lamar, uh, Soldier Pond, re-roofed the library. 42 squares of shingles. Uh, $2,940 is what it cost. Oh. The estimate that I got from two, two different contractors, actually three different contractors, um, to replace the roof last year, $16,000. So that gives you a sense of the donation, the size of the donation that was made on the labor side of this thing. Because all we did, is, and we went to SW Collins, because they had been gracious enough to give us some dollars. We wanted to keep the money locally. So all of the materials came from them at a, dis at a, at a heavily discounted rate. And then all of the labor was supplied. So we did really, really well with the replacement of the, of the roof. And thank God for Larry and uh, Travis Delisle and, and their crews because um, that, that's kind of priceless. And there's the, the photos, so they put up some signs. You can see them up on the roof doing some work. And uh, the Masons had help from all over the county. There's some guys that came in from, I believe, Holton uh, to help Larry and his crew. And, of course, 4D Carpentry, which is Travis and the four boys. Or it might be three boys. I think you, I don't know what that what that cost was. Michelle would have a breakdown of the cost, but one of the major costs um, is disposal of the old asphalt shingling because that's all got to go to you know transfer station and there's a charge, there's a tonnage charge, and that stuff weighs several tons. Um, so uh, coming back to the fact that operationally speaking. It's hard for the library to stay afloat without the rental income. So uh, one of the things that we couldn't continue doing was try to nickel and dime our fundraising with book sales and, uh, and uh, you know, small food sales. But there was a group that was interested in trying to raise funds 
for the benefit of the library. And that was established and called the Friends of the Fortune Public Library. The members uh, initially were Lee Terrio, Elise Aldrich, Cameron, Dr. Cameron Grange, Jake, Jake Terrio, uh, Lee Pelletier, Andrew Burden, and Karen Lett. And what they, what they did is they incorporated themselves into a 501c3 organization with the single purpose of helping fund the needs of the Fort Kent Library. Uh, there's a reason that they were created and separate from the library. The li for whatever reason, over the course of time, the library itself, uh, the status of the library from a tax standpoint became an issue. And we were back and forth with Internal Revenue and trying to iron this all out. And in the meantime, we knew this was going to take a long time to get, get done. Uh, and in the meantime, we figured it was quicker for somebody to apply for 501c3 status than it was for the library to do it for various reasons. And so that's why this was, uh, this is, that's why this happened. So what you see with there is uh, on September 3rd of 2019, uh, the Friends of the Fort Kent Public Library were granted 501c3 status. And that began their fundraising efforts towards the uh, funding the operations of the library. Initially, the utilities part of the library expenses. Uh, and in particular, the heat. For obvious reasons, you live in northern Maine, the heating and cooling is, is going to be expensive. Uh, and so that was their primary objective. Oh. But I'm showing you on this slide, and just for the sake of reference, that's the bottom two sections of the library that are rentable space. And off to the, to the right is the, a large conference room. And then as you move over to the left, there's this, some small spaces. One of them is a bathroom, place for the oil tank, and the furnace room, and uh, the uh, entrance on the... Uh, uh, easterly end of the library, as well as a couple more office space. I'm back and refer to those a little bit later. So here comes the grant funding request. We knew that there were some monies available, and uh, for for some obvious reasons that you may be aware of, um, the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation are renowned uh, for their generosity towards libraries in particular. And so we, we applied for a grant uh, through the town of Fort Kent, knowing that the town had already received, some, already received some funding from that foundation for the replacement of a fire truck, I believe, or some fire equipment. Uh, but Susie felt that it was worth the application and that because it was for something that was completely different, uh, that it would go through. The other thing that we weren't quite sure of is that you can apply to the King Foundation more than once, but it's in a three-year cycle. You can't apply within a three-year period. But we did apply. Uh, the application was rejected. We got in touch with them. They, they, they could not specify why. And they also could not tell us why we had not received a letter denying us uh, the grant. But they kind of left the door open for us. So, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of closed out the discussion on, on really good terms and figured we'd just try it again. Well, here's the second attempt. In April of 2020, through the friends of the Fort Kent Public Library that now had the 501c3 status, we applied for the grant funding uh, to the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation on behalf of the library. Here's the project budget. So there were quotes and estimates that were included, but uh, Home Solutions provided us with some estimates. 
wished Electric out of uh, Soldier Pond uh, offered us uh, an estimate or some replacement of uh, electrical uh, wiring, fixtures, that kind of thing. Uh, we wanted to purchase and increase our inventory of books. Uh, that was 10000 Meadows House of Flooring gave us a quote to replace the flooring on the bottom half of the library. Uh, Phil's handiwork on ceiling and, and painting and touching up walls and then some miscellaneous stuff. At $49,000 worth. Remember that we had estimated somewhere around 60. We had raised 20. Uh, and so we applied knowing full well that we, we would not get $50,000 from them. But we, we are, uh, but we knew that we could probably get half. And that's what we applied for. And so what you're seeing there is the library is seeking funds to renovate. Uh, the library is looking for $25,000 to complete the following renovations. And the same that I mentioned, lighting to be replaced with efficiency, lighting, LED fixtures, uh, masonry and carpentry uh, to do some work downstairs and remove some support posts, added in 80, two ADA compliant bathrooms, one uh, located behind the librarian station uh, and move that around a little bit and we'll talk about that. And then a, an engineered girder downstairs to keep, to remove, uh, like I say, some uh, support posts to give us space. And then painting and flooring and that kind of thing. So uh, in any event, uh, that's that was the application. What you're seeing here, oops, I want to do that. Okay, what you're seeing is the new lighting. Uh, and it went exactly where the old lighting was. It left very little marks in the ceiling, thank goodness. Uh, the, bot, the picture, the photo to the left is, is, is uh, the current restroom. And, and, behind, and, and rather than being behind the librarian, you can actually access it through the adult section of the library uh, without going through the library to the librarian's desk area. Uh, you also see that bottom photo where the book uh, catalog used to be. That was all removed and replaced. And, and uh, uh, we were going to put the door there to go into the restroom. And then somebody came up with a wonderful uh, uh, option. And we moved it around to the, towards the backside. So it's hidden from the public, but you can access it through the adult section. So that's a major, that's a major improvement, uh, especially for the librarian and the whole COVID thing for a while. It's, it's good to have a restroom that was a little bit away from the general, uh, from the librarian's uh, desk. Uh, there was a librarian, there was a library open house, 150 years, uh, sesquicentennial, Fort Kent sesquicentennial. And, and remember I talked about uh, Michelle having a display with all of this information that I presented or some of the information information that I've presented to you today. These are the bids for the parking lot. So one from Karen's Paving for uh, $4,300. And there was a, an another one that was a little bit more money. Uh, but I managed to get all the $5,000 from the Lions Club. Uh, thank you to them again, because um, now that's going to go towards a renovation of the, now that's going to go towards renovating the entrance. Um, so that brings us, and I hope you, you heard most of what I said. I know my head <laughs> keeps moving around, and Don said, don't do that. Uh, but here we are uh, to the future portion. And I say filled with potential because the sky is kind of the limit, uh, depending on the funding, right? So coming back to, there's a larger uh, version of what I said showed you a while ago, but you see the open room, number one, off to the right. That room is 18 by 19, 342 square feet. That's a sizable space. The problem with it is it has a couple of support posts in it. We're hoping to remove those support posts and make it a wide open space for various functions. And then you see as you're moving towards the left, there's, some, there's a hallway, number three. Five is a small 
uh, closet. Four is the, is the restroom, and this is not the scale, but uh, and then the rest of it is small office space, where Mutual's Insurance used to be, and where North State had office space, and Dave Susie had office space. Uh, that's all there. This is back to some of the information that was included in the uh, Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation uh, request. And I'm not going to bore you with the, with, the, um, with the particulars, but one of the things that it says here is that the lower level of the library will be great uh, uses of space for, and some of the things that were mentioned were used books, a teen adult maker space area, uh, to host internet-based activities and commonplace reading areas for patrons. A featured King conference room. We, we named that for the obvious reason. And uh, maybe use it as a place for authors and book signings and book clubs to meet. Uh, in addition, we would showcase art renderings featured by local Valley artisans. So that's just some of the things that were discussed in that uh, application. So back to some interesting ideas that have been bounced around. Uh, so increasing access to current literature and add more books as requested by patrons. There's some monies that are, that are available through that foundation grant for books. Increasing children's activities, including developing more cultural relationships with our Acadian St. John Valley heritage such as cooking classes or knitting, uh, SD or STEAM, uh, STEAM uh, activities, children's reading circle. And I say STEAM, it's probably STEM. Addition of book, a book lovers club for adults and creation of maker space for all age groups. Develop a new family welcome package letter for surrounding communities and then increase collaboration with local institutions such as Bogan Books for reading circles or highlighting local authors and bringing in outside authors. I'm going to come back just, to, just for a second on Makerspace. Those of you who have never heard of Makerspace, it's small, sometimes larger areas, but let's say for upstairs in the children's section of the library, under each of the windows, if there was a small desk, a collapsible desk, for instance, where a child could use Lego blocks, molding clay, uh, maybe a small erect erector set kind of thing. Those kinds of things where children could use the library space for something other than books, something that's educational at the same time. So that's something that's been discussed over a period of time. Uh, downstairs, you could have maker space for the, for the Teenagers, for adults. But that would uh, consist of, I'm not quite sure at this time, but I'm, I'm sure that there's things that, that could certainly be done down there that would bring those age groups into the library. Uses under consideration. Um, and here I, I titled this the King Foundation Conference Room. It may end up being named something entirely different, but for the time being, that's what, that's what we're referring it to, referring to it uh, as. Uh, community Access multi Multimedia Communication Center with, here we go, Zoom conference capability for remote interaction with book authors, small class instruction, business meetings, those kinds of things. That's something that not many places have in Fort Kent. I'm sure the hospital does. I'm sure the university does and you know, other places in the school district. But as a public space, as a public available space for a small business to host a Zoom meeting, for instance, potentially that could be done there. Um, a small art gallery featuring local artists and on some type of rotation. And I think ideally both of those functions could generate some sort of income. But there's a lot of potential for that space down there. Um, we actually had conversations with other groups of people who wanted to use the space for rotating office space 
or somebody that needs office space for a few hours a week and might come in and use some space. Um, so those are all potentials. Uh, I wish I wish everything, every square inch of that space was a money maker for the library. Unfortunately, it's not. So we have to keep relying on the generosity of the townspeople uh, and others. But that, in an hour and a half now, is uh, the history of the Fort Kent Library, both, uh, you know, all of it, past, present, future. And I, you know, would certainly entertain any questions or comments. But, um, you know, we, we, we've been around a long time. The library has been around a long time. We hope they're going to be around for another 60, 70 years. But we never know from year to year what this library or other libraries are going to look like. That's, a, that's an evolving thing. Uh, but what's interesting is that the patrons and the numbers of people who come into the library are no different now than they were 10 years ago. The number <laughs> still there. It may be the scene, it may be the, a smaller number of people frequenting the library more often, but it's being used. And that's what it's all about. So thank you everyone for putting up with me. Steph, I want to thank you very much for doing this for the Fort Kent Public Library. This was very, very informative. Stuff, some stuff that I did not know, and I'm on the board. But you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Steph, thank you. Uh, certainly on behalf of Senior College, uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, a lot of good information. But, you know, the one thing that I came out of the presentation with is that you're continually trying to um, accommodate different groups, different uh, different mediums. I mean, we're now living in an electronic world. And... Uh, you know, trying to get invite invite people there so they can use the services, which is uh, excellent. You're, I mean, the library's keeping up with the times. Uh, we'll see you uh, in the fall. <laughs>